Hello, and welcome to Botfield. Today I'm going to be telling you about occupancy grids. We'll be using these a lot in the future to talk about mapping and path planning algorithms. Coming to help out is this robot named Tango. Tango is placed on a map. The map isn't empty, it has some obstacles in it. When Tango moves, how do we know that Tango hasn't hit something? Let's take this simpler map. Tango can hit any of the three edges of the triangle. Each of these edges can be represented by a line. We can find the equation of the line, and you have some path that Tango takes. The path also has some equation that describes it. If you have both equations, you can determine if and where the lines intersect. But where they intersect doesn't tell you the whole story. When Tango is here on his path, he's basically been impaled by the corner of the triangle. Easy, you say. Just map the lines that follow the edges of Tango and see if they overlap with an obstacle. Interesting idea. Seems like a great way to impale your robot. You could add some lines in the center of the robot, but it starts to take a lot of time to calculate the intersections of all those lines, and there could always be something that you miss. In reality, you probably don't know the exact position and equation describing an obstacle, or the exact path your robot is going to take. That means that everything gets a lot harder and takes a lot more time to calculate, if it's even possible to calculate at all. This is where occupancy grids come in. Take this map and place a grid on it. In each of these squares, a number represents if the robot can go into the square or not. But what about these squares that are partly empty and partly obstacle? You might suggest that we look at how much of the square has an obstacle in it, so that if it's less than 50% obstacle, we label it with a zero, for example. But remember that this number between 0 and 1 is the only information we have about the square. If the robot moves into one of these squares labeled 0, it expects not to run into an obstacle. As a result, no matter if the square is 90% or 1% obstacle, we have to treat it like the whole square is an obstacle. This is the only way to ensure that the robot doesn't hit anything. It often happens that the robot isn't completely sure if a square is an obstacle or not. Maybe it's 80% sure it's an obstacle, or 20% sure. If the robot doesn't know anything about the square, it will be labeled with a 0.5, because it has an equal chance of being an obstacle or an empty space. You may have noticed that the final map we ended up with doesn't really look like the original map. You can change the number of squares you have in your grid to increase the level of detail. The more squares you have, though, the more space it takes up on your computer, and the longer it takes the computer to analyze and update the map. For a lot of algorithms that take advantage of occupancy grids, the algorithm will pretend that a robot like Tango is in the center of whatever square he is currently in. As Tango moves, though, you can see that he can be in an empty square and still hit obstacles, sometimes overlapping them by quite a bit. That's because Tango is larger than a square. In this case, Tango overlaps with one ring of squares around the one he is on. All these red squares are really saying is that Tango shouldn't get within one square of the obstacles. If we label all these as off-limits for Tango, so long as Tango stays in the empty squares, he won't be able to hit anything. You'll notice that Tango can't get between these two obstacles, even though he has plenty of room to get through them on the original map. This is an indication that we should use more grid squares to represent the map. There are ways to represent complex maps with a lot of detail without using too many squares. This one that I'm going to show you is called a quad tree. One square is completely empty. Splitting it into more squares wouldn't give us any additional information, so we won't. We only split up the squares that are partly empty and partly obstacle. And then we do it again, and again, and again until we are satisfied with the results. We haven't used many squares, but we have a pretty detailed representation of this map. For quad trees, algorithms will still pretend that the robot is in the center of the square. But unlike in normal grids, the robot will not always be adjacent to the same number of squares. It's also possible to have 3D occupancy grids. These are the same as in two dimensions, except that instead of squares, you use cubes. And each of the cubes will be labeled with a number. There are also 2.5D occupancy grids. These are the same as 2D occupancy grids, except that each square has some height instead of occupancy. This is a way to describe simple, uneven terrain. In the next few videos, we'll be using occupancy grids to help robots find the best path from one place to another on a map, starting with algorithms like the Wavefront algorithm, and eventually getting into some lesser-known algorithms like the Bellman-Ford algorithm. So make sure to subscribe if you want to learn about it, or if you just want to see more of Tango.
We hope you enjoyed learning about occupancy groups.